Hi, this is the Social Good Podcast, news and inspiration to help you make a difference. Hi, welcome to the Easter 2018 interview, which isn't a new interview, but a reissue of the very first one. Corrie Fraser started Kids Club Kampala during a gap year experience in Uganda, and the charity's been going ever since. I'm really grateful to Corrie for agreeing to be interviewed by a complete stranger with no track record. It gave me the confidence to stop procrastinating and get on with it. You can help Corrie and other past and future interviewees by reviewing the podcast on iTunes. There's now a link on the website that makes it really easy to do so. You can secure the podcast's long-term future by, com- by becoming a patron, either via the Patreon platform or by visiting our Social Good Podcast site. That's socialgoodpodcast.com. Thank you again for listening and helping spread the message. Back to Cory. I asked Cory to tell me her story. I started Kids Club Kampala when I was 19, and along with some of my close friends. Um, the first time I ever went to Uganda, I was 18, and I went there on a volunteering program, uh, one of those gap year things. When we were there, we were working with children in schools and teaching English and things. But at the age of 18, I really didn't think that I was qualified to teach (laughs) and I didn't have any experience teaching. So myself, along with some of my other friends and team members, didn't feel like that was the best use of our time um, in Uganda for for the people that we were meeting. And we really wanted to help and help the children who we knew couldn't afford to go to school because in Uganda, the poorest of the poor don't get to go to school because um, it's not free. Most schools require um, school fees and uniforms and all the things that you might need to go to school and that's just outreach for so many children. So we decided that we wanted to do a bit more to help. So And you would have been how old roughly? Eighteen at this 18. point. Eighteen and you're gonna change the world. Well <laughs> change the world, I'm not sure, but we really felt like there was something that needed to be done. So we along with um one of our Uganda friends called Sam, who now is the Ugandan director of Kids Club Kampala. Back then we were just friends and um, he brought us into the slums for the first time and it was myself and my now co-director in the UK, Olivia. Um, We all went in and did kids clubs on a Saturday and that's why we got the name Kids Club Kampala. So every Saturday we would go to two different communities and we would play games, sing songs with kids and allow them a bit of time just to be kids because most of these children were doing a lot of work around the house. They were potentially, some, some of them were working already to try and get a living for their families. They were doing a lot of chores like carrying water, and a lot of difficult things so we decided that we could just give them a few hours of just being kids and having fun and that was the original aim of kids club and at this point it was just something that we were doing on our days off from a volunteering program but when we left after our gap year i went and moved to the uk to go to university and this would have been when This was at the age, I was almost 19 now, and it was in 
So whilst we were back in the UK going to university, Sam and some of the Ugandan volunteers were continuing to do the kids clubs on Saturdays and we realised that they were slowly, well quickly running out of money to be able to do this. So in the first holiday from university we decided to go back to Uganda and um, we spent almost three months there for our whole university holiday and whilst we were there Olivia, Sam and I really felt that we needed to do more to help these kids. So um, in the slum areas of Kampala, there's not that many NGOs that are willing to work there because they're unsafe. They're also changeable, so um, things change all the time. They have a lot of social issues. Families have substance misuse issues. There are issues of prostitution, child labour, you name it, those issues are, are there in the slums and it's quite difficult to have a, a long-standing presence because things are changing a lot. And there's a, a lot of different ethnicities, different languages, rather than working in a small village, which is usually all one ethnic group who all know each other and one a measurable impact that you can have as an NGO. So for that reason, there are not that many NGOs working in these slums and providing support. And we realised that if no no one was going to do anything for these children, so we, we had to do something. Um, but were you scared? Or are scared. you scared now? Or <laughs> yeah, I think at the age of... Does your mum sit at home going, oh, <laughs> all right? At the age of 19, I think we didn't quite realise the risks we were taking, but I also think that we just were so overwhelmed by the poverty that we saw um, in the slums, and we saw that these kids literally had nothing, no shoes, um, no education, no proper food, and they were literally on the edge, So we and we realised that no one was doing anything to help, so we had to do something, so it was really... We were very compelled by that compassion rather than really thinking about <laughs> how we were going to do all of this. So, and initially we really just started fundraising to help the kids that we'd first met. So there were two different communities, about 200 kids, and we thought we'll start fundraising just to provide the kids with some shoes and some clothes and some mosquito nets to protect them from malaria. And what year would this have been? This was still in 2008. So we decided that we were going to start an organisation in order to fundraise um, and we registered in Uganda first and in the UK we started fundraising uh, alongside some other charities um, under an umbrella. So what we did was we just kept fundraising and um, I was a student at the time so I just did this in my spare time and um, little fundraising events here and there um, asking my fellow students to donate. What, so what was the funniest thing you did or the most dangerous or what do you remember from your fundraising days? Fundraising days? <laughs> Well, fundraising days are still continuing, but yes, yeah, back, the then, back then we we started to get to know some of the women in the slums, the mothers of these kids, and some of them knew, were really talented in making jewellery and crafts, and um, we so we would um, provide them some market for that. So we started to sell these crafts and jewellery in the UK, and I remember as a student convincing a whole load of young boys that it was important that they would wear this jewellery, which I think now is quite hilarious. I must have just um, been so desperate to sell this jewellery. Um, so I got a lot of um, young guys buying jewellery that they were never going to wear, <laughs> which was great. But um, yeah, so we just continued to fundraise and then it's just completely expanded since then so originally what was a really small vision has just grown exponentially so we were working with 200 kids in two different slums and now we're working with up to 4,000 children in 18 different slum communities 
So we have kids clubs on Saturdays, which is what the whole organisation started with. But from that, we've got to know these children in these communities and all of our volunteers who are Ugandan are from these communities as well. And they run these clubs every Saturday. And from that, we've developed all these other projects as well from um, a community-led perspective. So we have women's groups, like I explained before, about um, supporting women to have a sustainable income through making jewellery, but also with small-scale agricultural projects like um, pig projects, rearing pigs, cow projects selling milk, chicken projects selling um, eggs and things. And we've also got, um, we've also developed lots of other support projects for children. So we have three different communities that we have drop-in education classes for kids. And these are kids who just cannot afford to go to school. And we noticed that children during the weekdays were just wandering around completely unsupervised because their parents were desperately out trying to find work and there was just no supervision for them and they couldn't afford to go to school. So we started at these drop-in centres called Encouraging Education Projects and now about four, 500 children are coming to those every day and just receiving basic um, education with reading, writing, numeracy skills alongside just having a safe space to be in. And on top of that we're also doing feeding projects so after those classes every day there's a hot meal fed to about 500 kids as well. So that and we've noticed a huge difference in the levels of the health of the children that we're working with. They're able to concentrate better. Do you measure your outcome? How closely do you measure your outcomes or yeah, so we as a we ha we have a lot of impact reporting in terms of um, taking stories of, of children who have been involved in our projects, speaking, to, doing interviews with their families. We have parents meetings every month, um, and we're able to see children's progress. So that is really encouraging. You're sitting there all calm and, and serene almost, but you've been doing this for, for nine years. Mm -hmm. It must have driven you up the wall sometimes, or has it been because you've been part of a team <laughs> and you all seem to work really closely together? What have been the ups and downs? I think it's been really, the ups have probably been um, just seeing the change in the communities that we work in and seeing people flourish. I mean, this year, for example, we, I was able to, a couple of months ago, meet one of our um, first sponsored children to graduate. We also have a sponsor programme, which means that people here in the UK support children by paying £25 a month for them to go to a formal school in Uganda. And we have 115 children sponsored through that project. Um, and recently I, I was able to um, go back and meet our, one of our sponsored children who's just graduated from high school and begun university. So that's a real amazing impact that we've had in her life. Um, her story is quite amazing, really. She um, she was going to school, um, but had to drop out because she was living with her mother, who, she, who was a single mother and didn't have enough money to continue to go to school. So she couldn't finish sec secondary school. She couldn't go to secondary school. Um, she met a, a family friend who came along and he said he would pay for her to go to school. Um, only to find out a few minutes, a few months later that he intended to marry her when she turned 15. So he said that um, when you turn 15, you need to drop out of school and I'm going to marry you. And of course, at this point, she felt like she owed him because he'd been paying for her school fees to start secondary school. Um, but at this point, her mother had heard about Kids Come Kampala and they came to us and asked for help and we enrolled her onto our school sponsorship program. They moved away from that community and refused the proposal for marriage and now she is um, 
as I said, she is graduated. She started studying international development herself, and um, she's working part time to put herself through education. So that was a really inspiring story. So hear, hearing those stories and knowing that we're having an impact is really amazing. But as you said, there are some downs sometimes too, and I think those are just the immense responsibility it feels to have so many communities relying on you in one way um, and just the some of the really sad stories as well because people are living on the edge how do, you, how do you look after yourself or do you get compassion fatigue <laughs> i think um i think it, yeah it's important to uh, be able to also have a, have time to relax um, but it's it's difficult when you are running a small charity, meaning that you are really a jack of all trades, doing every type of job. You know, you're doing marketing, you're doing fundraising, you're doing monitoring, you're doing evaluation, you're doing so many jobs in one. So it can be difficult, but I don't know. I think um, personally, my faith is something that helps me and and gives me time to to really realise that I'm not alone in this, I think. Um, and, yeah, the team that we've got over in Uganda as well, seeing them. You talk about your face and you're named after um, Corrie Ten Boom. Tell the listener who's never heard of her mm. what, what inspired your parents, presumably, to name you yeah. after her. And do you, do you feel any, any affinity or do you have another mentor or, yeah. or, a, or a hero when you go, I want to be like them? Mm. I think, um, yeah, Car for those who don't know, Cara Ten Boom was a lady in, um, during the Second World War who um, created a hiding place for her Jewish friends to save them from concentration camps. But in the end, she was actually found out and sent to a concentration camp herself. However, once she was eventually released, although she lost all of her family, she's then started a campaign to of forgiveness, really, and went around the world telling people how, uh, about forgiveness. And um, famously, she actually forgave one of the prison guards who was responsible for her sister's um, suffering and her sister's death. So. Being named after her it certainly is inspiring, I suppose, because she showed strength in putting others first rather than herself first. And I think always looking out for and standing up for the people who don't have a voice in that time, it was Jewish people. Um, and I personally feel that um, people living in the slums, in poverty, in in Uganda anyway, are really not listened to on a global scale. People don't make decisions on their behalf in um, the most powerful places in this world. They make decisions that actually negatively impact them. So being an advocate for them in one way spurs me on. Um, as a child, I always um, wondered about why this world was so unequal. and. Um, I didn't understand why there were some people living in such poverty so I think it's always been something that's been with me um, my ethos I suppose on development is also that it should be community led and run by people for people um, and that's another reason why all of our staff are Uganda and all of our volunteers are from their local communities because they know best what help that they need and um, I love that all of our projects that have developed have developed from ideas from people themselves. I certainly wouldn't have known the first thing of what to do to help people out of poverty. They, they themselves have their own dreams and we're here to support those dreams and help them on their way rather than enforce a new dream that they don't have. So we have women who learn tailoring because they want to be tailors we didn't tell them they had to be a tailor we have women, we have women who 
rear pigs because that's something that they're interested in. Um, we've also started a carpentry workshop for young guys to learn a skill. And again, that was something that came out of a suggestion from young guys themselves in the slums who said, we, some of us have some skill in this and we'd love to develop it. Um, so that's something that inspires me as well. What have been your major challenges? Um, I think some of the major challenges are just being able to um, be sustainable. So uh, This is something lots yeah, of small charities struggle with. I think it's tough yeah. to get regular income. Um, we've got a, a lot of really amazing supporters who personally support us regularly with £10 a month or £5 a month. Um, but how, did you, how did you get them? Did it take a long time? Or? I think um, it's really developed, our support has really developed from personal networks and grown out. Um, and also when people support us, they they say that they know where their money's going and then they know that um, we have the community's heart, like at heart, rather than um, the organisation at heart. So I think people really come on board and join the Kids Club Campala family when they do give and they stay with us for a long time which is fantastic um, so it's just been a slow process really to to have that but we really still need more people to donate regularly we don't have a lot of people who do and um, I think it's hard to just yeah, know, know what next month is gonna is gonna be like. So that's probably the biggest challenge. What advice would you, if you could go back in time and speak <laughs> to yourself, talk to yourself um, when you started? What would you what would you tell Corey to do differently? To do differently, I'm not sure actually. I think. I'm not sure. <laughs> I think I because I started this charity along with um, friends and we were all young students at the time. We really learned on the job. I think um, maybe to be more confident because at times it was difficult when it was difficult to be taken seriously as an 18 year old, 19 year old who and I can understand why, but, um, and, and we took a lot of advice from a lot of people, which I think was great, and we still do and still need more advice, um, but maybe just to be a bit more confident in, and just to, yeah, just to go for it, because um, if, I, if I think about the decision to take this risk and start this charity, I think if I was faced with that same decision today, today, I may not take as many risks, but that just shows me that it was right at that time, because as you grow older, your risk-taking behaviour <laughs> reduces, I suppose, um, and we've, we've learned so much along the way and been able to become more and more sustainable and... Um, and yeah, but I think I, I have a real belief in grassroots organisations and I think that big NGOs have a real role to play especially in emergency responses but I really think that in order to be connected to communities grassroots organisations are so valuable because they're that gap in between that stands up for the voices of the, of the poorest of the poor. There's a lot of organisations working with people in poverty but we're working with people in chronic poverty who are even when other people other parts of Uganda are developing these are the places that are not developing these are the people who are actually missing out and being left behind so someone needs to be there I can't think of anyone better to be there than your organisation what are your plans for, and we're recording in December 2017, what are your plans for 2018? 2018, um, if I'm honest, 
2017 has been a difficult year for fundraising and Brexit has affected the exchange rate, which means that we're, we have a, a lot less to, to play with really and, and coupled with some inflation in Uganda. So we're hoping to just do some more fundraising and build, build up our sustainability. Um, but in Uganda, we're um, continuing to run all the projects that we do. We have a project called the Iwafe Project, which means where we belong in Uganda. And it's for children who've been abandoned or have nowhere to go. And this is an emergency home for kids. Um, we firmly believe that children shouldn't live in institutions and that they should be living with family. So over that last number of years, we've been reintegrating children with their family members. Um, so this year, we are continuing to reintegrate children with their families and we're planning on developing that project to also um, include foster care. So fostering children within families rather than within institutions. Um, so that's one big plan for this year. And, and if people want to get in, get involved, get supporting you, um, what's your website address? Um, if you go to our website, it's www.kidsclubkampala.org, um, or you can follow us on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, which is at Kids Club Kampala. Um, yeah. Fabulous. Thank you very much. If there's uh, something in your eye, like there is in mine, they're the links. Thank you for listening. Thank you for your time. Thank you.